talk about something really quickly and that is uh, teamwork. Um, I will cover it briefly here because some people asked about it. This is just like me rambling like some old guy. Uh, so teamwork. You will be forming, storming, norming, Performing, and this may even have to do with uh, lab partners too, where forming is, oh, do you have time during this time? Oh yeah, I have time, so let's form a group. And then sometime during this, you're going to anger each other, or you might miss appointments or miss each other, and you'll you'll not work well, and then you'll get over your differences, and then you'll start or doing some good work and then you'll actually do really good clicking as a team and that's performing. Um, not all teams will go through all four of these. I had a team last semester, uh, Jessica was part of it, or I should say last year, where there were two MEs, two uh, compies slash double E's, and throughout the process they never hit storming. Um, they, everything they were assigned, they got done. And if somebody had something that was really going to be time consuming over the next week, what they would do is they would uh, uh, cover for each other for that one week. All right? So uh, that is a part of a team, team effort. By the way, guys, don't forget the camera's right there. They hear what you're saying. All right? <laughs> So the, uh, uh, the whole idea of this is if you're in anything where you're doing peer evaluation, it's usually good to get everything out in the open early, 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 all right? And if you do have some trouble and it's not getting resolved, that's when you need to get the assistance of your supervisor, in the case of senior design, your instructor, faculty advisor, and they will take care of stuff. We have had courses where we've taken the team and just you two teams are doing the same project, half the people. Go at it. So, yeah, I just bit rambled, sorry. There we go. All righty. Oh, then I had some question. Can you do a sample problem? Let's do a sample problem that might be helpful for the exam. So let's make this example. Feel free to do more than one. Pardon me? So feel free to do more than one. Oh, gosh. You just... You just wanted me to delay as long as possible so I don't hit no, the material. No, you're doing A to D. <laughs> Say that again? You're doing A to D. I you bet you I can. All right, so you have a vehicle. That you wish to add a Collision avoidance system. It will be sound based. The goal is to stop. Five meters before the object. Assume the max uh, speed will be one hundred and fifty kilometers. Per hour. What is that, about 90 miles an hour or so? 
a little bit over. <coughs> the stopping time of your vehicle is or stopping distance. of your vehicle is n meters. How far in front of the car should your Sensor detect an obstacle. I should say a stopped obstacle, since that's your worst case. So, because I want to make this a fairly decent number, I will go to my handy dandy uh, notebook. Yeah, mail time. How far you go? Your car should be I will do a quick Google search. How far is the internet? Oh, Internet Chrome is now my my all time selected. Uh, what do we have? Google. Ooh, what happened in the market today? Was it? Ooh, it's a bloodbath. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bloodbath. Yeah. All right. Uh, what else means? Automobile. Too bad. I do not know how to spell. Stopping distances. Distance and time. We'll look at the guidelines. Feet per second. Oh, come on. something really quick. I just wanted to figure this out for you, so. I just wanted general. Any, any good? Uh, if we're at 100 kilometers per hour, I read that it should be about 40 meters. 40 years? 40 what meters. meters. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really, I can't find one for 150. What? What is? Add 10 meters. meters. Sounds like play. Yeah, the uh, the problem would be right, 60, um, 60 meters. Yeah, it is 60. Uh, if you're going at 150 kilometers per hour, it's it's not linear, correct? Right. Oh, right. It's definitely not. So let's put it here. Let's put it here. That's going to be a hard enough problem. <laughs> oh, kilometers per meter. There we go. Initial skid length of the line. You're the right. Skid length of the line. All right, there we go. 125 uh, meters. I'll just be really nice. Wow, look at, look at how much difference that is. Ooh! <laughs> I can add. I can add wet asphalt. Oh, cool! Oh, yeah! 
bookmark that. That's pretty cool. Oh, I get it. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to bookmark this box. You know. Yeah, do smell. Nice. Nice. <laughs> 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 All right. So you uh, you have your marching orders. What I'll do is you're gonna figure this out, and you're gonna let me know uh, what you think. All right, the general consensus is that this problem might have been a little bit too tough to be putting on an exam. Um, one thing I should mention is that there were some corrections um, to this. In other words, uh, we said that the stopping distance, or we should look at the, uh, the sensor, uh, should be able to sense a stopped object so you can stop in time. Uh, we also added the speed of time as 330 meters per second. Some people say it's 340. It's actually a variable dependent on temperature and altitude. I'm just going to make it simple. So, one person's suggestion. I'm allergic to uh, math. Is to take a look at the following. What you're looking at is the diff distance traveled while the wave is heading this way, and adding to that the distance traveled while the wave is coming back. Remember, this distance here is going to be typically slightly more than this distance here. Plus, you have to figure that it's going to take 125 meters to stop on dry pavement. And then we wanted a 5 meter uh, guard band in front of that. Uh, of course, if you were designing a real system, you would take the worst case of uh, stopping most likely in the case of wet pavement or snowy pavement. Or a real system would, uh, um, would detect what your environment was like. Is this, is this uh, wet pavement? Is this dry pavement? Is it asphalt? Uh, and then it would adjust accordingly. Uh, no, it's not allowed to shoot into small little bits, the thing that's in your way. And uh, the other assumption that you can make is um, hitting it is not a good thing. So the, the simple case of this, I like this uh, example, and, I, and I, I have to do the math to see if this works out. And, and again, this is probably a little bit too complex to give to you. So um, distance the car travels before it receives the sound back. Don't forget the velocity of the car is 41.67 meters per second. That's equivalent to 150 kilometers per hour. Then you have to imagine what is the, uh, what is the distance in air, well, the distance that the, uh, the sound wave is going to uh, take, assuming that the, uh, um, the sound wave, actually the distance in air, that's the distance of the sound wave, what it's going to travel. So obviously the, the uh, sound wave travels from here, back here, and then to here. So uh, the, um, the answer is, or the, uh, the, the assumption is the following, uh, d car over v car is going to be equivalent to d air over v air. Uh, once you solve for d car, which is on both sides of this equation, um, you can get the number 37.54, which then, of course, is added to your guard distance. Uh, which will be 167. By the way, the distance in the air, I should say the distance that the um, braking needs to start, you also have to uh, assume that uh, this is 2 times 130 because the sound wave goes in one direction and then it returns. 167.58, which I've heard some people say pretty close to what you got, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. I rounded. Too complex. Going on? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Get it right.
You are a light sensor. Your light sensor take a break and do this. I'll do this and then you have a break and take it in the work. Yeah, while while we talk. Let's see. Your light sensor. I tell you what, yeah, let's do that. Let's take a break and I'll that'll give me a little bit of time to formulate the problem. Alright. The uh, a problem could be a sensor works between 0 and 5 volts. I should say a light sensor works between 0 and 5 volts. When a black stripe is detected, on a white floor the output voltage is one is I should say between 0 and 1 volt. When the white floor is detected, <coughs> voltage is between 4 and 5 volts. Assume you have a 10-bit ADC, a, what is the, oh shoot, the focus went off. What happened there? Focus. This is bizarre, all of a sudden it just went, went nuts. Looks like it zoomed in. What is the digital value for detecting a black line? What is the minimum <coughs> digital value for detecting the white right floor? This is a nice problem. What do you think? No. It kind of combines, you know, our concepts of sensors and A to D. Arms crossed, you already solved it? Just about. Just about? Still working on it a little bit more, almost there. Quick next time. Yeah. So, the answer is? First thing is, what is the formula? So what is the A to D formula that we used Thinking about it? You find the maximum value that a 10 bit number can hold, right? Right. All 
All right, there we go, right? So obviously we're looking for two different numbers. Black line, white floor. So to understand what it is, well obviously the maximum digital value for detecting a black line is how many volts? Five. One. How many bits in our A to D converter? Mm. 2 to the N minus 1. That's all going to be over. What is our maximum V ref? Five. Mm -hmm. Five, right? Mm -hmm. We can't see it. Yeah, we can't see it. <coughs> For me? Plus one half. That's the max. Plus one half. The max is five. Plus one half. Sorry. And then for white, it's going to be n equal to how many volts is the minimum? Four. Four, right? Again, it's still two to the ten minus one over 5 plus 1 half, taking the integer of this. Anybody have their handy dandy calculator to let me know what the answer is?
like a third of it or something. Okay, I, I like, that's all I'm going to do. So I'm going to go over some more material, not as much as I wanted to, and then we'll call it a day, and what I cover for the rest of the class will be on the test. Will be? Will be on the test. Sorry. Gosh. Haven't I uh, used the adage about uh, drinking your favorite beverage? What? Okay, obviously this isn't going to happen. Okay. State machines and slam. But that will be on the final test, so <laughs> that's going to be fun. If you choose to take it. Was it replaced? Uh, one of your other two exams. So I'm going to talk about electronic parts. Actually, I'd be surprised to uh, let's see if you guys know how to do this. I'm taking some pictures and I'm going to uh, um, see if you know the names of these. Alrighty. So, the one on the right-hand side, what type of packaging is this? Beer. It is a yeah. dual inline package, dip. Mm -hmm. This one here is called? So first mile. Mile. No. Mile. Right. It's in. I heard one. It's in. Uh, before, I, before anybody shouts it out, how many actually know what the name of this is? Well, then raise your hand. Okay, the answer is? Ball grid array is correct. Ding, 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 ding. Ball grid array. Ball grid array. So, I'm going to go over some stuff. Yes, sir. Ball grid array. What does that look like not as a cross section? I will show you a picture of it later. And in fact, most of your. Uh, larger electronic parts are ball grid arrays. Uh, with some exceptions, uh, some microprocessors actually have big, huge pins, but they're really big, really wide, like uh, lots and lots of pins by lots and lots of pins, because it needs to plug into a board. So let me just go over this. All right, memory details. RAM, random access memory. What you will typically find in an embedded system is what's called static RAM. In other words, when you give it information, it will stay in there until you remove power from the whole chip. And the reason why it's really important is because once you write something into that device, you don't have to go back in and do what's called refresh the contents. <clears throat> Other types of memory called dynamic RAM and you add any sort of uh, acronym on top of that. Uh, there's all sorts of them. There actually has to be some process which goes back in and basically rereads and rewrites that same position just to keep it energized and saved in there. <clears throat> which takes sometimes processor time. The reason why you don't like it in embedded systems is you want to concentrate totally on whatever the problem is that that device is to do. A, a mobile phone, you don't have to spend time continually uh, refreshing the RAM. If you have a PC that has scads and scads of other stuff going on, um, going in and refreshing the, uh, uh, the memory device uh, not only takes time but takes energy and usually you have a big battery on your big honking uh, desktop machine, not so much on the uh, laptop. 
but a lot more memory, or I should say a lot more battery power is available on the PC than your typical mobile phone. <clears throat> so that's why embedded system designers like SRAM. The difference, SRAM is really, really, really expensive compared to DRAM. And if you look at, for example, a, uh, a microcontroller board or a microcontroller itself uh, that you'll find in your typical embedded system, it will have a small amount of RAM on the chip itself because SRAM is also large compared to DRAM. It has more electronics, more uh, transistors to keep the, uh, uh, the, me the memory active in there at all times. So, when you're doing uh, robotic systems, what do you need? Which one do you think? SRAM. SRAM? <laughs> I like that. Uh, it depends on how much uh, memory you need. If you have a robotic system that needs uh, uh, a gig or two gig or four gig of memory to run, chances are you want to do dynamic RAM because you just don't have enough space to hold DRAM and it's going to cost a lot. However, if you have your smaller little device, you probably go with uh, SRAM. Now this is what's called volatile memory. So volatile means whenever you take away power, poof, it's gone. But there are non-volatile memory devices which are very important for embedded systems as well as robotic systems. There is ROM, read-only memory, PROM, programmable read-only memory, the electrically programmable read-only memory, and electrical, electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. I'm sorry, EEPROM is erasable programmable read-only memory. Uh, the difference between EEPROM and double EEPROM is that EEPROM is the device that had that little window on it, and that when you apply a uh, ultraviolet uh, light to it over a certain amount of time, it'll erase. You probably don't see too many EEPROMs anymore, and for that matter, you don't see too many double EEPROMs anymore. Reason being is that those technologies are typically replaced by flash, where you put in a, uh, a whole bunch of memory at one time, you usually put it in a flash device in blocks of 4K, 8K, and it's, uh, it keeps it for a very long time, if not forever, down a very long time. And uh, one of the disadvantages of flash is that depending on the technology, um, it could uh, start to fail after being rewritten a bunch of times. Uh, ROM and PROM typically are with devices that you program once and that's it. Actually, ROM is something that is manufactured directly. So, if you think about a ROM device, how many ROM devices do you have on your person, do you think? Oh. Read-only memory. So when they manufacture the microcontroller for a watch, the code is always going to be the same. You're not downloading new code to this watch, right? right. Chances are the calculator is pretty similar. It might be electrically erasable because I think some calculators can be updated, right? Yeah. yeah. So from that respect, I think the, uh, the device for a calculator is probably closer to double EEPROM. The advantage of double EEPROM over flash is that double EEPROM could be byte addressable. You could change a single byte, whereas in flash you have to change, as I said, a block of 4K, 8K. So if you have a robotic device that requires you to collect data and maybe change a configuration byte or a couple of bytes in your uh, device, do you want flash or double EEPROM? Double EEPROM. All right. In some devices, in some microcontroller devices, you have some flash and you have some double EEPROM. The flash is reserved for memory or for uh, program space, and then the double EEPROM is reserved for variables. What about any other memory devices you, can you think of? Is flash talking about the USB? Flash drive, yeah. flash drive is an example of uh, a USB okay. drive. It's the same technology, flash technology. Okay. 
of a hard drive. Which, by the way, you notice that sometimes flash drives fail after a while, right? Yep. Of being the same location, being written again and again and again and again. On a flash drive, we'll actually put software in there to use the entire flash space. If you erase something and then put something back out there, it'll put it in a different location. So it'll try to use all the locations on a flash drive equally and share the pane across all of it. All right, can you think of any other memory devices? How about hard drive? Hard drive, very good. As you can imagine, heck of a lot slower, right? That's why solid state uh, memory drives are becoming very popular. First of all, they don't fail as, quite as often as a hard drive does. Because mechanical usually is the first thing that fails on a computer. So it's a mechanical guys, right? <laughs> you like money. I don't know, I've seen the box fall apart. You make it fail out of the gun. It's usually the hard drive that, uh, uh, that, that fails and it's the, uh, the spinning of it. All right, uh, what about another memory device? Hint, hint, very similar to a hard drive. CD, optical drive, optical disc, right? <laughs> floppy disk. What about floppy disk? Yeah, floppy disk. Yeah, well that's obsolete. You guys are so funny. All right. Uh, we were just talking about that the other day. What's the uh, what's the largest floppy disk size that you've ever used? Three and a half. Five and a quarter. Yeah, three and a half. Five and a quarter. I think you just showed an eight inch. I've got uh, I've got an eight inch floppy in my office that we used uh, when I was first doing computing. Eight inch, yeah, amazing. Thing. So that's an iPad right there. I think we'll leave it that one, right? Oh. All right, electronics packaging. Pardon me? Leave your suit Larry. Here we go. All right. Uh, when you are making an electronics board, which is going to be the heart of your uh, robotic system, you need to think about all sorts of packaging technologies that you're going to use to make this board. As you can imagine, we've seen the boards. Does anybody happen to have a board that's out in the open, the Renaissance or anything else like this? Now you're going to crack it open. Right? If you think about your uh, your typical, are you going to be brave enough and you're going to find one? I had to go and look back. Oh, so there we go. There we go. You're a liar. You're joking. No, I guess I have to go and look back since last semester. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have here a. Um, That's why you get. How many people have uh, nightmares about this board? Yeah, no, 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 no. Oh, it was easy. It was easy. Yeah. We have here electronic board, different types of technologies being used for this. A lot of surface mount. How can you tell if something is through hole? Because it goes through the other side. It goes through the other side. <laughs> when you can see if there's a hole that goes through the board, there you go. Um, but you, you look at this. I don't think there's any chips that use through hole. Most of these are connectors. These are all connectors here. Um, these are these are uh, uh, push buttons. These are switches. I'm looking right here. Is the uh, um, right here is the area under on the other side is the um, LEDs or the uh, the digital displays. That's even soldered, not through hole, but uh, on the surface. So let's take a look at some of these uh, technologies here. That's where we zoom in. I'm going to hit the autofocus so it doesn't freak out. Oh, wow. What is the first thing you notice about this chip right here? You see any pins? No. All right, hold on. What do you mean? Pins? Stop. Good. You don't see any pins there. If you look at this part here, do you see pins? Yes. All right. Surface mount, it is soldered to the surface. And in fact, if you look here very carefully, you see, well, either there is purposely something soldered right there between the two, or that's a problem. 
Is that the one you burn out or what? No, I use that one. That's actually a good one. That's what I do. All right, notice that these extremely small parts right here. So that part right there is what? Capacitor. It starts with the letter C, so that means capacitor. That starts with R. 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 Resistor. The size of these parts are most likely what's called 0204. So it's 0.2 millimeters by 0.4 millimeters. Can you imagine? They even have 0102 parts that you basically play with like sand. All right. Here's another part over here. See if I could. Uh, here's something here. Well, what's the size again of the 0204? Uh, it should be point zero point two by zero point four millimeters. This is for a jumper that you could add in later. Let's see if I can find any other good parts. Well, one thing I wanted to show on this part, see if you could actually see it. Gosh, I can't even find this part. The clock? Uh, the crystal? All right, you can see the edge of it there. You see them? Mm -hmm. yeah. A little bit. We're looking at here? The ball array. This is the part that's closer to the front of it, by the way. Oh. Right here, right along here, right? Mm -hmm. Little balls. Oh, wow. Little balls are underneath the part, little balls of solder. So what they do is they place small balls of solder paste down, and then when they make this part, they just basically place the chip on top of the solder paste and then they run it through an oven, which melts the solder and holds the, uh, the part into place. <coughs> What's the advantage of something like that? Space. Well, it's not going gonna to have short circuit if something falls on top of it. All right, I heard somebody say back there, space, right? Yeah. Because now, even though there's not all that much right here, you notice that there's a lot of pins on the outside, a lot of pins on the outside that you have to start routing. When all the pins are on the bottom, even, even that, you look at all the pins emanating from it, right? Yeah. The pins are coming out, or the uh, traces are coming out from the sides. They're also coming out from the bottom. If you look at the other side, right here, each one of these little circles that you see right there is what's called a via. The VIA is taking the signal from the other side of the board and routing the signal in. So here's a, uh, here's a, man, I'm going to have to zoom in on this puppy. So here is an example of a VIA and then the trace coming off of that which is going to be a signal that's underneath the chip. We also have some more capacitors over here and uh, anything of lasting social value here. Well, here's, another, here's another surface mount part. This is a, a two-sided SMD part. And let's see, do we have any? And, up here is a what looks like another ball grid array, since uh, you can't see any of the pins. And actually, I guess this is the closest you're going to get to a dip part. Uh, right here. Where is it? 
internet sorry. Right here, these uh, eight pins are connected to a, uh, a socket, which you can insert whatever you want. The name of this, notice it's going to be uh, um, Let's see, U6. I'm not sure that this is uh, correct. Usually they have uh, a part designator that starts with U for a part like this. Um, I'm looking for a part that actually has a U designator on it. They're non-standard. Ah, uh, they just call it IC, in this case IC14. Okay. So, getting back into the slides. Some packaging is ideal for inexpensive toys, some for rather expensive boards like this. For example, a ball grid array is not for an expensive toy. You would probably use, in fact, in some cases, a dip. And it also depends on where it's manufactured. If it's manufactured where um, a dip is needed to be soldered by hand, it's not being soldered in the US. Of course, the leads between the packages, which I mentioned to, small copper traces. And the whole idea is that you're soldering in your chips between and connecting the traces between the two. So we looked at this dip, dual align package. Dual flat pack is the two-sided one that we saw, surface mount. A quad flat pack has uh, parts on all four sides. I'm looking to see if this is one. I think that was one. <clears throat> so this one looks like it just barely has pins on the outside along all the sides. Not as uh, not as impressive as the other one. Also notice that sometimes your chips will have rather big leads on it. In this case, this is a crystal that's running at 50 megahertz, and it only has four very large uh, um, solder connections on it. And then, of course, the ball grid array. Here is an example of the uh, um, what it would look like in the bottom. And notice that this is, I think this is a memory chip. So notice that you have not necessarily uh, these solder balls on the, on the bottom of all of them. It could be square. It could have a big giant space in the middle that it doesn't uh, connect. But that's just an example of what it would look like. Uh, I think I've showed these videos already. But oh, there's no time like the present. See if this will actually allow me to pull this up. Is that that little This is the uh um <coughs> don't like take up a lot of power, but only move, move a little bit. No, this is a uh um manufacturing device. Yeah, yeah this is this is gonna go slow, so let me start from scratch. You know, routing it through here is not going to be good. I'm going to start from uh, from where the file actually is on my drive. So this is uh, manufacturing a printed circuit board. This is the board right here. It's picking parts. And there is solder paste already on the board. 
So what it's doing is it's placing the part on the solder paste. So it's a little bit like glue. And again, when this is all done, it's going to run it through the, uh, the oven and all the uh, solder is going to melt. And, and basically, uh, when it solidifies, it holds the part into place and makes the electrical connection. I already mentioned what the uh, red over here was, right? The red is light. There's, in the middle of that uh, hole, in the middle of this hole right here is a camera. And when the part is picked up from down here, it's hovered over the camera. The camera will be able to tell what the orientation of the part is. And so it'll actually adjust, it'll adjust the twist of the part itself. So when it places it down, it's exactly the way it should be. Because when it picks up a part, the part may be like this. It may be slightly skewed this way. It may be slightly skewed that way. You don't want to place it on your board like that the first time and like this the next time. You always want to place it correctly. So it'll adjust the twist of the part. Question? Uh, yeah. Are the ball grid arrays, are they like more expensive or less expensive to produce? Ball grid arrays are a lot more expensive to produce. And the reason you'll do it is because you have a lot of I.O. pins. And you really want to save on space. Because imagine this. Uh, when, you have a, uh, when you have a device and you're putting it on a, uh, on a board, you know all those pins coming off the side, right? Don't forget on the inside of the part, there's also wires that are going from your silicon to the outside of the, uh, of the plastic. So if you have a lot of wires coming from inside to the outside, things may get kind of bunched up, might be crossing over, things like that. So if you route it directly out the bottom, there's a lot less distance the wires have to travel and there's not as much uh, uh, room for air. There's, there's less room for, or there's less air possible. All right. Any other questions? I could uh, pretty much assume there's going to be something about electronics on the test. Who knows? Maybe multiple choice questions. That'll be great. Any other questions?